Hi, my name is Philip. Today I will explain how to find correlated or statistically significant patterns in data. So we'll talk about data mining. By the way, if you want to try the algorithms and ideas I will talk about today, you can check out the SPMF software. It is open source. It has algorithm and data sets to try. Okay, so let's start. The topic for today is how can we search in the data to find patterns that indicate a strong correlation or that are significant. They don't just happen by chance. Okay. So to explain this uh, topic, I will talk about frequent item set mining. It is a popular data mining task. And then we'll see how we can change it to find the patterns that are that have a strong correlation or that are uh, significant. So first, we will review briefly what is frequent item set mining to make sure this is clear. Okay. So frequent item set mining is a task in data mining to analyze data. Frequent item set mining means we want to find patterns in the data that are frequent, that appear many times. And item set means some sets of values. So we want to find sets of values that appear many times in the database. So the input in frequent item set mining is a database, like the one I show you here. So here I use the example of shopping, but it could be applied to other things. So in this database, we call a transaction database. Here I have for my example, the data about uh, shopping. So e we have four transactions, T1 to T4, and each transaction is a set of items or values. So for example, the transaction T1 means a customer bought pasta, lemon, bread, orange. Okay. Transaction two means someone bought pasta and lemon together, and so on. So we have data like this about shopping, or it could be about other things. And then the user needs to set a parameter called the minimum support, min sub. And the goal is to find all the sets of values we call frequent item set that appear at least min sub times in the database. So let me show you an example to make this clear. Here I have the same database I have shown to you before. Then let's say we set the minimum support to two. The frequent item set will be this. Okay, you can see in the PowerPoint here. So for example, lemon is a frequent item set because it appears at least twice in the database. We have lemon, lemon, and lemon. So three times, okay, at least two. So lemon is a frequent item set. Let's look at another one like lemon pasta, okay. So lemon pasta, one time, two times, three times. So lemon pasta is at least two times. So it is a frequent item set. So we can use many different algorithms to find the frequent item sets, like a priori, a clad, and so on. I talked about these algorithms in other videos before. Now, there is a question about this. Even if you find this frequent item set in your data, should you believe these item sets? Should you think that these item sets mean something significant in your data or not? Okay. So for example, we have pasta cake. Pasta cake appear many times in your data. Should you believe that it is something meaningful for you or not in your data? Does it mean something? So should we believe these item sets? Okay. The answer is no, not necessarily, okay, maybe, maybe not, because many item sets are spurious, 
So what does it mean, spurious? Spurious means that these items in, in some item set are weakly correlated. That means maybe they just appear together by chance, actually. So for example, if you look at pasta cake, it appears twice, okay? It is a frequent item set. It appears in 50% of the transaction, two out of four. But even though it appears many times, it, they are weakly correlated pasta and cake because pasta appear in all the transactions. So you can see pasta appear four times and pasta cake only two times. So pasta and cake, actually, even if it is frequent item set, it does not mean anything, okay? Because there's always pasta anyway. So it does not mean there's a, a real relationship or correlation between these items. So how to solve this problem? Let's say we want to find the item set in the data that means something. They are significant. They have a strong correlation. So there are three different solutions. First, we, can, we could use some special measures to evaluate the correlation between the items. So for this, we can use some functions like the bound or all confidence. I will explain to you after, okay. The second solution is to apply some statistical test. And I will explain this to you also today. And another solution is to find other types of patterns like the association rules and so on. Okay, so let's start with the first solution. I will explain to you what we can do. I will talk about the bound first, okay. So the bound measure, it is a function we can use to verify if the items in an item set are correlated or not. It was proposed in this paper here, you can see. So I'll explain it to you. First, I need to give a few definitions. Then I will explain the bound and I will explain some property and some algorithms, okay, to find item sets using the bound. So a first definition that is important is the conjunctive support. Conjunctive support, actually, you can ignore conjunctive. It means the support, as I explained before. Okay. So the support of an item set, we also call conjunctive support, is simply the number of transactions that contain that item set. I call X here. So here we have a formal definition. The support of X is the number of transaction T such that X is included in T and T is a transaction from the database D. Okay. So for example, the support of pasta orange together means how many transactions we have pasta and orange together. So here it is three. So the support or conjunctive support, it means how many times, okay, we have sets of items in the database. So this is something we saw before, but we did not call it the conjunctive support, okay? This is the name we give here. Now, we introduce a new definition called the disjunctive support. The disjunctive support of an item set is the number of transactions that contains at least n item from x, but maybe not all of them, okay? So we call it d sub of x is the number of transaction t such that x and t, they have some intersection, okay? At least some item from x are in t, and t is a transaction from the database. So let's have a look at the example to make this clear. So here we have the disjunctive support of pasta orange together. 
So that means how many transactions of pasta or orange at least. Okay. Pasta, orange, or pasta and orange together. At least one item. So here we have, for example, pasta or orange. We have pasta, is okay, at least one. Pasta, orange, pasta, orange. So the disjunctive support of pasta, orange is four. Okay. Now, we introduce the correlation measure called the bound. The bound of an item set will be its conjunctive support divided by its disjunctive support, as you can see here. So let me explain this with an example. It will become very clear. So for example, I want to calculate the bound of pasta orange together. So it will be how many times we have pasta and orange together. They must be together, okay, the support. So it is three because pasta orange, pasta orange and pasta orange divided by the disjunctive support. So how many times we have at least one item from pasta orange? So it is four. So the bound will be 0 0.75. So this is very interesting because the bound tell you these items are uh, strongly correlated. If the value is close to one, it means there's a high correlation. So how can you interpret this? Okay, it means 75% of the time, if you have one item between pasta or orange, at least, at least one of them, then you will have the two of them together 75% of the time. So it then indicates a strong correlation between pasta and orange. Okay, to find something meaningful in your data. So, as I just explained a little bit before, the bound will be a value between 0 and 1. 1 means the maximum correlation. They are always together, these items. And 0 means no correlation. Okay. So here I give you a few examples for different item sets where the bound will be from 0 to 0 0.75, for example. So for example, cake and bread. How many times we have cake and bread together in the database? It is 0. There are no transactions with cake and bread. So the bound of these will be 0. So that means no correlation. If we have a look at another one, like lemon and bread, how many times we have lemon and bread together? It will be one. We have lemon and bread one time. Divided by how many times we have lemon or bread, or the two together. So one time, one time lemon or bread, and another time we have lemon, bread, or the both together. So 1 divided by 3 means 0 0.33. That means weakly correlated. Okay. So using the bound measure, we can evaluate an item sets contain items that are correlated or not. So the bound measure has some interesting properties. Now I want to explain to you. The first property of the bound, it is that the bound of an item set X that contain a single item is always equal to one. So for example, if you take the bread, for example, how many times we have bread? One time divided by how many times we have any items from this item set. It will be also the same. It will be one always. So the result will be one. If you take another example like pasta, it will be four divided by four. It will always be the same. So if you have an item set with one item, the result will always be one. We could do the proof. 
to not be difficult. So this is one interesting property. Another property of the bond that is more useful, it is the a priori property of the bond. Or uh, so what does it say? If we have two item set x and y, and x is a subset of y, the bond of y will be less than or equal to the bond of x. So we also uh, call this the anti-monotonicity okay, of the bond. So what does it mean? Let's look at an example. The bond of pasta is a 1, for example. If you have a superset of pasta, y, like pasta lemon, the bond cannot be more than 1. It must be less than or equal to 1. So in my example, pasta lemon, the bond is 0 0.75. Now, if you take a superset of this, the bond can only be less than or equal to 0 0.75. So pasta lemon orange here in this example is 0 0.5. So this is very important property to reduce the search for item sets. If you know pasta, lemon, orange as a bound of 0.5, you know that all the supersets of this item set cannot have a bound more than 0 0.5. Okay, so if we want to do the proof of this property, it will not be very difficult. So here I want to give you the the main idea. By the definition of the bound, if you have two item set x and y, the bound will be defined like this. Okay, this is by the definition. Now, in this property, we said x is a subset of y. So, because of this, we know that the support of x must be greater or equal to the support of y. This is the a priori property of the support we prove in other videos. Now, if we look at this part, the, the disjunctive support, we could show that the disjunctive support of x must be smaller or equal to that of y, because y has all the items from x plus some more items, so it can be more than this one. Okay, so and if you look at this, this part will be uh, bigger for x and this part will be bigger for y. So the bound of x will be greater or equal to the bound of y. This is the, the main idea for the proof. Okay, we could go into more details to make it more formal, but I just want to give you the main idea. So let's continue. Now, how can we use the bound to find the correlated item sets? So, I will show you one task, finding the correlated frequent item set using the bound. So, the input will be a transaction database, a minimum support threshold to find the frequent item set, and now we have something new, the minimum bound threshold, which will be a value between 0 and 1. And the output will be all of the frequent item set x, such that the support of x is at least equal to the minimum support, and the bound will be at least equal to a new, the new parameter, the minimum bound. Okay. So this is like it frequent item set mining, but now we have added a constraint on the bound to find only the correlated item sets. So let's have a look how it works. We take the same example as before. We try to find the frequent item sets appear at least twice. But now we have a new constraint. The bound must be at least equal to 0 0.75. So that was the results we found before in frequent item set mining. But now we have the bound, so we will eliminate all the item sets that have the bound smaller than 0 
So for example, lemon orange, the bond is uh, too low, 0 0.5. It is less than 0.75. So we will only find a few item sets that have a strong correlation. So all the single items, they have a bond of 1, as I said before. And then we have lemon pasta and pasta orange. And that's all. Okay. Other item sets, the correlation, the bound, is not high enough. So this will be the result. Now, we could also change the problem to find something else that is very interesting. We could find the rare correlated uh, item sets. Okay. Rare correlated item set using the bound. So we want to find some item sets that are not frequent and that have a strong correlation. So this is interesting. So the input will be a database, as I have shown to you before. A threshold we call the maximum support because we want to find item sets that are not frequent. Okay. So we want to find item sets that will have a support that will be less than some maximum and again we will have a, a minimum bound threshold we want to find item sets that have a bound that will be greater or equal to that threshold so let me show you an example how can we do this so here i have the same database like before and i set the maximum support to three that means I want to find item sets that appear less than three times, one time or twice, but not zero. Okay. Uh, and I want the bound to be at least 0 0.6. So in this case, I will only find three item sets. So this is interesting. Okay. Like the bread, for example, it appear one time. And the bound is one because it is a single item. So one time the support is less than three and the bound is at least 0 0.6. So it is okay. Now let's look another one like orange cake. Orange cake appear two times. It is less than three. So it is not frequent. It is okay. And the bound is 0 0.66. Why? Because orange cake appear two times and orange or cake appear in three transactions. So here we have orange, orange and cake, and orange and cake. So two divided by three will be 0 0.66. And it is at least 0 0.6. So these are the rare correlated item sets. Okay, so let's continue. So, if we want to find the rare correlated item set in the data, we could use some algorithms, like one is called CORI. Okay. This algorithm is based on ECLAT and was proposed in this paper. So I will explain the main idea so you know how it works. So, it will use the same uh, approach as ECLAT to search for the frequent item sets, the, actually the rare item sets, not frequent. Because we want to find the item sets that are not frequent and that have the high bound okay, in this algorithm. So first, we know the bound of all the single item is one. So this is easy to calculate. Now, after this, how about the other item sets? So in ECLAT, if you know already about this algorithm, you know that ECLAT will combine pair of item set like X and Y to make the larger item set Z, such that Z is the union of X and Y. So now the problem is, if you combine two items, X and Y, to make an item set Z, how can you calculate the bound of Z? 
So to do this, according to the definition, we need to find what is the conjunctive support of Z and the disjunctive support. So to do this, we will use two data structures. I will explain them and then I will show you how we can use them to calculate the bound. So, there will be each item set will have two structures. One is called the TID list, the list of transactions. So, the TID list of an item set X will be the list of transactions that contain X. I will show you an example after. And we have another structure called the disjunctive transaction ID list. It will be the list of transactions that contain at least one item from X, but maybe not all of them. So let's explain this in more details with an example. It will be easy to understand. Okay, so I will explain these two concepts again with an example. So what is the TID list of pasta? That means all the transactions that contain pasta. So pasta appear in T1 to T4. The TID list of pasta lemon is all the transactions that have pasta and lemon together. So one time, two times, three times. So one, two, and four. T1, T2, T4. And bread orange, the list of transactions is T1 because bread orange appear together only in T1. Now, let me explain the disjunctive transaction list, okay, the DTID list. So what does it mean? For pasta, it means all the transactions that contain at least one item from this item set. So here it is the same. Okay, it is T1 to T4 contain pasta. Now for pasta lemon, the DTID list will be all the transactions that contain at least pasta or lemon, but maybe not all of them. Okay, at least one of them. So pasta or lemon we have at least one of them in all the transactions. So it will be T1 to T4. Now for bread orange, all the transactions that have at least bread or orange. So here we have in T1, in T3 and T4. So this is the list. So you see it, the TID list and the TID list are not the same, okay. So why we use this structure? Okay, let me explain in more details. So from the TID list, you can find the support. If pasta has four transactions, it means the support is four. If pasta lemon appear in three transactions, the support is three, and so on. Now for the DTID list, it allows us to find the disjunctive support. So the disjunctive support of pasta will be the number of transactions in the DTID list. It will be four. Here it will be four because we have four transactions and here it will be three. So using these two structure, we can find the support and the disjunctive support and thus we can calculate the bound. This is all we need to calculate the bound of the item sets. So this is what the uh, CORI algorithm will do. First, the CORI algorithm will find the TID list and DTID list of all the singles item in the database by reading the database. So this is for the item sets with one item. Now, how about the larger item sets with two or more items? 
So if you take two item set X and Y and you combine them together to make an item set Z, then you have the following properties. Okay, very interesting. The TID list of Z will be the intersections of the TID list of X and Y. And the DTID list of Z will be the union of the DTID list of X and Y. So, if you know the, the structures for X and for Y, you can find the structures for Z also, the TID list and DTID list. And using these two lists, you can find the bound. So it is really easy to, to do, okay. So in this algorithm, C-O-R-I, it will be like ECLAT, but the difference will be, we will have the DTID list to help to calculate the bound. So, and then in this algorithm, if an item set Z has a bound that is less than min bound, we don't need to check all the supersets of Z to eliminate some combinations in the search space. So this is the main idea about this algorithm. Now, this is interesting, but the bound is not the only measure we can use to find the correlated item sets. There are others, such as the all confidence. So let me explain this one, and then we, I will tell you some more things related to this. So the all confidence of an item set is another measure. It is similar to the bound, but a little bit different and easier to calculate also. So the all confidence of an item set X will be the support of X divided by the maximum among the support of the items in X. So if you have X, the support of X divided by the support of each item in X. We take the maximum. This will give you a value also between 0 and 1, like the bound. So for example, let's see how to calculate. Let's say we have pasta orange. So how many times they appear together is uh, 3 times, as you can see here divided by the maximum of the support of pasta or orange. So pasta appear four times and orange three times. We take the maximum, it will be four. So the all confidence will be 0 0.75. Let me give you a second example. So by the way, 0.75 means a strong correlation. Close to 1 means strong correlation. Close to 0 means a weak correlation. So let me show you another example. Let's say we have lemon, orange, and cake. So together, lemon, orange, and cake appear only one time. So it will be 1 on top. Now we take the maximum of the support of lemon, orange, or cake. So lemon appear three times, orange appear three times, and cake only two. We take the maximum of three, three, and two. It will be three. So the all confidence of lemon orange cake will be 0.33. So this is the main idea about this. So this means a weak correlation. So for the all confidence, we also have some uh, interesting property. The first property is for any item set X that have a single item, the all confidence will be equal to one always. So for example, if we look at cake, the all confidence will be 2 divided by 2. It will be equal to 1. So this is like the bound. We add the same uh, property. Okay, it is similar. 
Now we have also a second property, the a priori property for the all confidence, the anti monotonicity. So this is also like the bound and the support. So it says if you have two item sets, x is included in y, then the all confidence of y must be less than or equal to the all confidence of x. So for example, if you have pasta, the all confidence is 1, then the supersets like pasta lemon or pasta lemon orange must have an all confidence that is smaller or equal to 1, as you can see here. So this is again very powerful property to eliminate the combinations in the search space. So we can use this to design the good algorithm. So if we want to design an algorithm for this, we could modify a frequent item set mining algorithm such as a priori and eclat to calculate the all confidence. And to do this, the only thing we need to change, we need to pre-calculate the support of each single item, what we need to find the all confidence. Then also, we can use the second property of the all confidence to eliminate the combination in the search space. So it's not difficult to do. Okay, so let's continue. We can make two interesting observations about the bound and the all confidence. First, it can be proven that for any item set X, the bound of X will always be smaller or equal to the all confidence of X. So if you look at the definition, it's not very hard to, to see that this is true, but you could make the proof if you like. Another interesting observation is that the bound and all confidence are null invariant. They have this property called null invariant. So what does it mean? It means that if you add more transactions to a database and it does not contain an item set X, then the bound and the all confidence of X will not change. It, it will not be influenced by this. So this is interesting because if you have an item set X like lemon pasta and you add more transactions that don't have lemon and pasta, it will not change anything for the bound and all confidence of that item set. So this is good if you have a lot of data, you have some measures that are null invariant. It is a desirable uh, property. Okay, so I explained two correlation measure on now, the bound and the all confidence. But there are others, so I want to give you some brief overview about this. So, some other correlation measure that I have seen in other papers, for example, there is the frequency affinity, the coherence, the lift, the cosine, the max confidence, and others. Here I put some papers that discuss these other measures. Okay. Uh, here I put also a table that compare these measures for a special case where we have item sets with only two items A and B. So I show how to calculate these different measures. I took this from the paper you see here. And we can see some properties of these measures. So the chi-square or the lift, it is a value between zero and infinity. And they are not null invariant. But the other measure between 0 and 1, and they are null invariant. Okay, so this is according to this paper. So, just to show you that there are many possibilities, but actually, in this video, I presented the all confidence and the bound because they are simple, simple to calculate, easy to understand, and I think they are very meaningful. So, I think they are uh, some of the best measures in my opinion. Okay, so beside that, uh, 
uh, beside the correlation measures, we could try to find item sets that are statistically significant. So let me introduce this other topic. So all the correlation measures that I have discussed, like the bound and all confidence especially, they make sure that the items are correlated. But the bound and all confidence, they will not check for the statistical significance. So if you want to raise the bar higher to select the patterns, we could use the statistical test to make sure the item sets are really significant from a statistical uh, point of view. So this can be very useful, for example, if you analyze the medical data and you want to draw some conclusions that are significant. So we need to include statistical tests. So how to do this? There is one very interesting paper uh, in 2014 about finding the non-redundant and productive item sets using statistical tests. So in that paper, they combine two concepts. Productive item set means statistically significant and non-redundant item set. I will explain after. And to check the statistical significance, they use the Fisher exact test. So let's see a little bit more what is the idea behind this. Okay, I want to give you some overview. First, I need to explain what is a non-redundant item set. An item set is non-redundant, also called a generator. I explained this in other videos, okay? If that item set has no subset that have the same support. So let's explain this with an example. Let's say you have an item set, pregnant, heart disease, and woman. Is it redundant or not? It is redundant because you can find a subset that has the same support pregnant and heart disease. It will always appear the same number of time as pregnant, heart disease and woman because if you are pregnant, you must be a woman. So these two item set must have the same support and that item set will be redundant. So non-redundant item set means to find the item set have no subset that have the same support, the gen generator or non-redundant item sets. The second idea in that paper is to find the productive item set, means that they are statistically significant. So the idea behind this is we want to check, we want to analyze an item set, look at the different items inside and see if we split the item set in two parts, each part will be independent or not, okay? So do they appear more often together or, or not, actually? So let me explain this, okay? We say an item set is productive if we divide into two partitions, two subsets, and they are positively correlated with each other. Positively correlated with each other means they appear more often when they are together than if they are not together. So let's say we have an item set ABC as example. We need to split into two parts and two partitions. So ABC we could split into AB and C, AC and B, and BC and A. So there are three cases. And we need to test the three cases with the, the statistical test to see if A, B, and C are correlated positively. A, C, and B, and B, C, and A. And if all these three cases are correlated, we say A, B, C is productive, is significant. So it is a high requirement. Okay, so let's look at an example. 
Let's say we have the item set alcohol and liver cancer. Here we can split in two parts alcohol and liver cancer. It will be productive because in the real life alcohol is positively correlated with liver cancer. It means if you drink alcohol you have more chance to have the liver cancer than normally. Okay, that's what we mean by positively correlated. Another example. Let's take another item set. Alcohol, liver cancer and black hair. Okay, so we can divide this item set in two parts and we can find, for example, that alcohol liver cancer is not correlated positively with black hair because it has no relationship. So if we find one uh, way to split the item set and the two parts are not correlated, we say that item set is not productive. So that's the, the, the main idea about this. Okay. So now how to calculate they are correlated or not? That is the main question. So to do this, we use the Fisher exact test in that paper. So how to do? You have two variable, okay? Studying, for example, and non-studying means, for example, alcohol or no alcohol, if we follow the same example. And then we have another variable like men or women. For example, as the cancer or don't have the cancer. So alcohol, no alcohol, cancer, no cancer. So now we need to make a table like this with the frequency. So here in that example, we have men. One man is studying. Eleven men are not studying. And women, nine women are studying. Three women are not studying. So these values, we call them ABCD. We put them in the formula and it will give you values like this. So let's say for studying men, the value will be 0, 0, 0, 1, 3, 8, 0. If it is less than the significance level, like 0 0.05, we say this is positively correlated. So this is just an example of calculation, okay? But we can do this with alcohol and cancer, for example. It will be the same idea. And if you want to calculate this by yourself, there's some online calculator you can use, okay? It's not very difficult. So that's the main idea about the statistically significant item set. So how to find them? There is some algorithm like Opus Minor will help you to find the non-redundant productive item set. This algorithm do a depth first search and the user must set a parameter k and then it will find the top k non-redundant productive item set that have the high lift or leverage. These are some other measures. There is also another algorithm called IDPI plus, which is uh, similar, use the same definition and will let you search interactively for the productive item set. So you can do some query. I want to know, for example, male tobacco Alzheimer together, they are productive or not. So there is an algorithm for this also. So in conclusion today, I explain what is a correlated pattern, especially for item sets. I explain the bound, the all confidence measures and their properties. I say there are also some other correlation measures and I presented one algorithm, CORI, and I talk also about the statistically significant uh, patterns. There are also some other papers about this. I did not present all the papers. I just wanted to give an overview. So if you want to try this algorithm, again, you can check the SPMF software in Java. It has the source code, the data, and you can play with these uh, type of algorithms to find the correlated or statistically significant patterns. So that's all for today. Thank you for listening. Bye.